Before we jump into the webinar today, I did want to remind everybody that uh, this presentation and the corresponding slides are copyrighted by Robson Forensic and may not be recorded, copied, distributed, or otherwise used without authorization. That being said, if you think that the presentation you saw today would be useful and relevant for your firm or your regional legal organization, reach out to us, especially with the convenience that we have with Zoom webinars and, and doing these, these meetings remotely or, or virtually, I should say. We can often accommodate those requests, usually at no cost. Uh, we really do hope to hear from you. So if you have a special request, if you have a topic that you'd like to see us cover, uh, let us know. We, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so on to today's program. Uh, the program that we have lined up today is, is really special because we're featuring three of our supervision experts. And in my experience, the, the supervision experts like we have today are particularly hard to find for these cases. Um, the fact of the matter is that the most qualified people, they usually don't do expert witness work, and, and we've got a great team. So we're going to kick off today with Dr. Lisa Thorson. Lisa, I'm going to stop sharing my screen if you want to go ahead and share yours. And Lisa is the head of our supervision practice at Robson Forensic. There you are, Lisa. And it's, it's really experts like Lisa that make Robson Forensic the special firm that we are because you know, Lisa, in, in addition to your, your decades of experience, I think you just have to hit, if you hit the, uh, the home button, Lisa, it'll take you to the top of your slide deck. Um, but in, in addition to your decades of, of experience in industry, you've also been with Robson Forensic now for nearly 11 years. And what that allows us to do is, is onboard new experts like Suzanne and, and Janice, who are gonna be joining us here today. And, and you're able to, uh, you're able to help them immediately apply all of their background and experience to this forensic work and, and experience that, that, that they're involved in now. So Lisa, it looks like we have you on the right slide. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background before you get started on your part? Yes, I can. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you for everyone who is attending our conference today. I'm very excited to present this webinar. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and to those in our group. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, I have worked in the um, education and rehabilitation field for more than 35 years. I have experience with all kinds of individuals uh, and with various disability groups, ages and settings, in addition to early childhood type care settings. I've worked at state and local levels. I've worked in collaboration with local providers and also run facilities that have been the local providers. So some of the casework that I do involves early childhood and that's in child care centers and or family homes. Um, I've worked in many different cases involving individuals with disabilities and that could be day programs, residential settings, school settings, groups home, just to give you an idea about some of them. Also done many, many playground cases in public and private settings and uh, sexual and physical abuse cases in all types of facility-based programs. So today what we're going to talk about is how safety in supervised care settings is created through a series of program and environmental strategies. So when we, um, safety doesn't start with the incident itself. It begins with the development and foundation of programs. So I'm going to liken that throughout my presentation to the construction of a building. So when we are creating a foundation for a when we are creating a program, we're creating a foundation. And within that, we're looking at who the targeted population is, because in everything that we do, that's exactly the focus that we're looking at. And is the program designed to meet the needs of that population? The policies and procedures, are they all built around that? And also, are we creating a culture of compliance within the standard of care? So every time that I'm looking at a case and analyzing that, I'm looking at these as my as my foundation. And with that, we look at, okay, well, what kind of staff do we have coming into the building um, to run our program? So what are, what is the hiring, screening, and vetting processes of the organization itself? So do they have written applications? Are those written applications clearly looking at uh, the writing capacities uh, of the individual that is applying for the position? Are there background clearances in place? And in the 
the population that we serve specifically, we are looking at um, vulnerable populations, so background clearances are required on all levels. And what kind of reference checks are being done? So oftentimes when I'm looking at a case, the cheapest and most effective, one of the most effective ways is reference checks and that's often not being done. So when we look at our perpetrators perhaps getting through the doors right from the start, we wanna look at these screening processes that the facility is doing to determine, one, are they getting qualified help um, to run the program, to hit the foundation and targeted population, and are they um, vetting that, that group? So one of the other structural components we're looking at is staffing. So what does that look like? Are job descriptions being um, developed? And are those job descriptions clearly giving the qualifications for the people who are being asked to do the, do the job? And are they aligning the qualifications with the job duties of the particular uh, position? One of the other things that are looked at is, are, are there appropriate and number of staff for the position? So in sh one of the things that we also look at in investigating the cases is, is the facility providing the tools needed to their staff to do the job? And that comes in the form of training and what does that look like? Um, is it measurable? Meaning that is this, are they providing training that we can say that the staff clearly understood it and there's written verification that it is being done? So for example, um, if, a CPR class, let's say, that's usually done in a practi practicum kind of measurable uh, characteristic. And then we can also look at, you know, is it a paper and pencil tense? So what are they doing and what kind of verification is that? And that's something that I can look at when I, I'm reviewing a case. Setting up an infrastructure within an organization is critical to ensuring that there is a safe environment. So are the policies and procedures that were developed specifically for this targeted population in this particular facility understood by the staff? Are they being implemented? Is it being enforced by administration? And is it being evaluated? So those are the things that we're gonna look at throughout that infrastructure of the organization. And we wanna develop effective systems. And that means creating safe processes and safe internal environments. So what is being done within this organization? Are there incident reports being written when an incident occurs? And do they look at those incident reports over a trend analysis? Are they able to say, okay, well, listen, we know that this, this is happening every time we have a transitional part of the school day. And with that, we have to then look at what is happening on our campus, what is happening in our program at that particular point of day. So if we know that this happened five times before then, then we clearly have noticed that it may happen again. So what is happening within that facility? And that's when we're looking at these effective systems and processes that are put in place to make sure that there's accountability throughout the program. When we are looking at the organization, we're also looking at not only supervision of our targeted population, but we're looking at the supervision of the staff. What bells and whistles does the organization have in place to ensure that the staff is meeting the expectations of the facility? So are there observations um, being conducted, informal observations, formal observations? Are there performance evaluations being conducted? So is the, um, or is the organization ensuring that they are constantly checking what the staff is doing and then when they do, um, determine that expectations are not being met, what kind of corrective actions are being put in place? Is it that we're just going to say you got to improve and that's it? Or are we uh, working with you to develop the tools that you need to improve processes within? So we want to have clear reporting systems, clear and effective communication systems throughout that in order to supervise the staff accordingly. In addition to supervising our staff, we want to clearly supervise the identified population within the organization. And that would be whether it's infants to preschool to high school to group homes, whatever it may be, we have to know the developmental abilities of the population being served so that we can supervise accordingly. 
And that means aligning the rules or the expectations with the abilities of the individuals served. So what are, what are the expectations? Are they clear? Are they concise? And are they being communicated to the population? Knowing the environment with which we serve is critical to supervision. So let's say we have an older building and our bathrooms are in the lower level of the building and the classrooms are on the second floor. We look at in comparison to a safety hierarchy, we can't design that out. It's already there, we're in this building. How are we going to supervise or guard and ward against it? So how do we supervise that? We have to change our processes, we have to change our procedures to look around that. And this could include visibility panels, it can include any environment, furniture within a classroom, any environmental um, fixtures within our facility to make sure that we are supervising around that. So in addition to that, what we wanna look at in preventative strategies throughout our facility-based program and designing that program is that to look at a policy and procedure as a living document. So what was originally the policies and procedures that were designed when we first started the program, perhaps there's been growth or change in population served, we have to look at are they do they still work and what adjustments are needed? What actions we need to be put in place and are, are, is the organization developing an evaluation schedule to ensure that these are looked at on a regular basis? So putting these preventative practices in place to develop a safe program are part of the things that we look at when we are designing a program to ensure that our foundation is solid and our program is safe for the for the students or the population that we're serving. So what this did is to give you basically a conceptual background about how we may attack a case. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take that into some practical application. And Janice Inman is going to be speaking to us today about infant death and childcare settings as one of the examples of some of the cases that we may work with. And then Suzanne Rodriguez is gonna speak with us about discipline intervention in school settings. So just to introduce Janice, Janice brings about four years of experience working in the childcare field to her forensic casework. She provides firsthand knowledge for the operations of quality early childcare at a teacher, director, as a teacher, director, and center administrator. Um, some of the cases that we do in this practice group in, in revolve, involving early childhood, and this is examples of not all inclusive, is infant death, we have burns, falls, suffocation, abuse, neglect, and, and Janice is gonna tell us a little bit about herself, and she's gonna also, as I said, bring that into infant child care. Janice? You need Janice, to put the sound on. Yes. So sorry about that. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. As Lisa shared today, I'm going to be sharing about um, investigating crib deaths within child care settings. To share with you the facility and the care environments that I do review with Robson vary in type infant programs being one of them, but um, I also will look at school age programs, child care centers that provide care for children, infants through age 12. Today my presentation is going to be focusing on those care facilities that provide services to infants three months through 12 months, and in particular looking at those incidences of and occurrences of crib death. What we're going to be looking at then is what is crib death? What are the national standards and the state regulations regarding infant sleep environments and how do they relate to crib death? And then also what are the preventative measures that can be taken to help reduce the risk of crib death in childcare settings? So looking at the program types that we'll be talking about is all of the three program types listed below are 
childcare settings that are provided out of the home. For children either infant, age three months through 12 years of age. Those are the types of programs that we're looking at. And they can take a couple of different formats. They can either be a child care center, which can enroll any number of children within that age grouping um, and are primarily located in non-residential settings. And then we also have the large family child care home that is in a residential setting environment and can enroll between seven and 12 children in their care. The small family child care homes also are in residential settings and they enroll between one and six children. All of these types of programs are licensed and regulated by their individual states. Some of the specifics regarding the classification or the requirements of the programs vary from state to state, but there are standard um, regulations that are particularly in place if any of these programs offer infant care and that would be care for children ages three months to 12 months. So what is infant death? SUIDs are, as they say, unexpected, sudden infant deaths, and crib deaths do fall within this category. Those that are considered or categorized as accidental deaths are situations of entrapment or entanglement. Now, entrapment situation would occur when a baby is wedged or trapped between two objects, and thus they're not able to breathe. An entanglement situation would be if an object is pressing on or wrapped around the baby's face or neck, blocking their airway. In a crib death situation, what we would be doing if we had that case is we would want to look to see, are there any entrapment or entanglement risks? For instance, an entanglement risk would be a baby who has their pacifier attached to their clothing by a string and it becomes entangled and wrapped around their, their neck. Um, an entrapment would be if a baby arrives and is put down to sleep on their tummy and in the process of nap, they become wedged between the side of the mattress and the crib. And then we would have a situation of entrapment. Another subcategory of the SUID is SIDS. There's approximately 4,000 SUID deaths in the United States each year, with 1,000 of those deaths being SID deaths and often they're occurring during the baby's first few months of life. Now for those little ones who are enrolled in childcare, 20% have a higher, 20% um, do have a higher risk of occurring in that childcare center. And we also know the importance of those first few weeks of enrollment and that there's a highest risk factor for SIDS to occur during that time for a baby. So, that's the reason that recommendations are established and industry best practices and standards and regulations are in place to establish safe sleep, infant sleep practices. Where do these practices and these policies originate from? Well, in the 1990s, the American Academy of Pediatrics developed safe sleep recommendations for babies with the purpose of public education and awareness. Over that decade, they worked in collaboration with a number of groups and joining with the National Institute of Children's Health and Human Development. Ultimately, the Safe Sleep Campaign, which is a worldwide campaign and highly recognized, was developed. Primarily what it states is that it's important to put our babies to sleep on their back in a sublime position rather than putting them to sleep on their tummies. And these recommendations have been very instrumental in establishing standards and regulations for the industry of child care providers. Some of those guidelines and regulations and standards that we have on the state level 
our state child care licensing agencies issue regulations and specifically regulations about safe sleep reg policies um, for our infants. Many states even also regulate crib safety, bedding restrictions, and mandatory SIDS training for child care providers who are going to be caring for infants. On the local level, we have our health department guidelines. And on the national level, there's a variety of national standards that we refer to and follow within our profession. One being Caring for Our Children National Health and Safety Performance Standards, which was developed in collaboration between the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Public Health Association, and the National Resource Center for Health and Safety in Child Care and Early Education. So in the investigation of a SIDS case, what are we looking for? What are we going to want to find? Well, one is we're going to want to know what the center put in place, what they did to reduce and minimize the risks of SID, um, SID factors. <laughs> and one key area that I would be looking at in those cases would be what's the program design of the center? I want to examine, does the center have a safe sleep policy in place to ensure that their sleeping environment is a safe environment for babies? What is their procedure and policy regarding supervision of their napping infants? What is their caregiver infant ratio? Are they following that? All caregiver infant ratios are established and regulated by individual states for which the facility operates. Does this facility or does this family home care setting utilize primary caregiver structures? Meaning that individual babies are assigned to individual caregivers who with a small group of children, usually one caregiver to three infants, will watch and care and nurture and, and support the baby's growth while they're attending that program. It's also very important that center directors or those who are supervising enter into the infant classroom, especially during those napping times, and not rely solely on um, video monitoring of what's going on within the classroom. Equipment is another essential part of helping to reduce risk of SIDS. We know from the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations that we're to put our babies down on a firm sleep surface. So that would mean that we wouldn't want our babies to be sleeping on adult beds, as an example, or futons or bean bags, but rather they would have their own individual crib to sleep on. We also would be looking to make sure that infant practice, the practice in the classroom, is, is not to be putting babies to sleep on what we call restrictive equipment. An example of that would be if mom and dad arrive to the center and their little one has fallen asleep during, you know, coming from home to the, the um, care facility and they've fallen asleep in their car seat. The caregiver will need best practices is to remove the baby from the car seat, put them on their back in their own individual crib so that they can continue sleeping in a safe way. One no, that's fine. <laughs> I was just going to share another example. Um, but in this preventing in the, the, of the design, um, we'd also be looking, <clears throat> we'd be looking for, um, that's okay, we can go to the next. So with our equipment, what we're going to want to do is make sure that there's a policy and a procedure in place that's going to verify and validate that the equipment has been inspected and it is truly allowing for a safe environment for our babies. So with a site inspection, I would want to take photographs of the layout of the infant classroom to ensure and measure that cribs are, for instance, three feet apart allowing for 
safe intervention of the caregiver to respond immediately if there is an emergency in the classroom with one of the babies, but also be able to make and take those measurements of the spacing between the crib rails, or if there's a spacing between or a gap between the mattress and the side of the crib, we would want to know what that is. Also observing to see, is there loose bedding? Is the sheet firmly fit on the mattress itself? And that there's no blankets and other things, stuffed items um, within the crib, that the, that the crib is only for the baby's sleeping space. Does the center also provide those evacuation cribs that are needed in time of doing drill, practice drills or evacuations? But in addition to this, we have non-napping features that have been shown to minimize the aspects of risk, um, to the risk to SIDS. And so I'd want to see the overall program structure to determine during non-napping times, what is the interaction and the activities that the caregivers have with the babies? For instance, the importance of providing babies with tummy time, not only for their social development, their stimulation, but also this is an opportunity and a time where the babies are working to develop and strengthen that upper body strength, their back muscles, their neck muscles. So they're able to roll over on their own, even then as they're maturing in their sleep and be in a safe position. We also want to ensure that the environment is smoke free. Now it is less licensing regulations that childcare centers, facilities, home care facilities um, are smoke-free environments. In particular, it needs to be true in the infant room. So time has to be provided for our caregivers who may smoke on a break that before they re-enter the infant room, they have opportunity to wash up, to put on a smock, change their clothes, to ensure that there is a, a clothing barrier between their clothing and the baby they're caring for. Janice, before you go on, we, we had a quick question that came in. Uh, we had Helen asking what preventive measures you would take for a baby that fell asleep in a, uh, a mobile chair or, in a, or, or a rocking chair at the child care center, how you would handle that in, in one of your facilities. Very good question. So in other words, I'm understanding that to be um, the infant swing, so a moving apparatus, or we would even say a stationary boppy seat. Um, that's how I'm understanding the question. If a baby is to fall asleep, it is important that the caregiver does go over and not allow the baby to continue sleeping in that piece of equipment, but rather very gently, very quietly, pick them up, carry them to their crib, and place them in the proper sleep on their back position for the remainder of their napping period until they awaken. Yeah, great. Thank you for handling that question so quickly. Um, uh, and, and sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, that was great. My flow. Let's get back. <laughs> um, Lisa had shared with us the importance of the hiring and the vetting and the interview process for any uh, anyone who is going to be working with populations. In our case, it'll be our infants. And this is very, very important. We want to make sure that those caregivers are qualified for this specific age group so that they comply with those specific requirements of the licensing regulations, but also that these individuals have valid first aid, pediatric first aid, and CPR certification. Part of the hiring process should also include an opportunity for the prospective candidate to visit the infant classroom to observe and see what is the structure, what are the procedures, um, what is the flow of that time. And for the supervisor to have an opportunity to observe the candidate, interact with the babies, to see if they have those skills and abilities and gifts that we will say, those nurturing gifts that are so essential for caring for our little ones. Training both pre-service and in service are also very important. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends to all licensing, state licensing agencies, that they require caregivers to have infant safe sleep training and SIDS reduction training prior to 
entering into the classroom caring for babies. And likewise, our National Association for the Education of Young Children recommend that teachers have regular annual training sessions that are um, practicum hands-on, not a passive mode of video, but something where they really are integrating that understanding into their learning. So when we review a case, we're going to be looking to see if those hiring protocols occur. We're going to want to see the employees' um, files, their training files, things of that nature. But we're also going to want to see what are the policies and procedures of the center, the care facility. And those policies are all based upon our standards, our regulations, and our industry best practices. So in regards to infant sleep environments, are, those, are our little ones, our sleeping babies, being supervised by sight and sound during their napping times? Is there an infant safe sleep policy in place in the care facility? And are there written medical waivers that are signed by the pediatrician and the family if there's to be any exceptions for medical reasons to putting the baby um, down on the back or following any other aspects of the sleep safe policy with caregivers only making exceptions if a written waiver is on file with the center and current. Policies will then affect how are the procedures in the classroom practices that are developed and implemented. Clearly respectful interactions with our babies is number one and that then influences everything that we do. But we're going to look at what is the layout of the infant classroom. Is it free of clutter? Is the caregiver able to move quickly in the case of an emergency to get to the crib to assist a baby or to a location, a swing location if a baby has fallen asleep or any other um, restrictive equipment to move them and get them to a place for safe sleeping. And in this, not just the location, and visibility of the cribs is important, but also the visibility of our babies during that time for proper supervision. So having the lighting in the classroom being at such a level that it will allow the caregivers to see the baby's face, to be able to check their coloring, are they sweating, what is their temperature, are they breathing? There should be nothing in that crib that would cover or entangle or prevent um, the caregiver from being able to visually see the baby's face to supervise. And lastly, so compliance, <clears throat> policy compliance and staff retention are signs of quality. And we know that training is not alone. It also needs to have assessment of the caregiver's performance and behaviors. And so having a system in place where the supervisors can have ongoing monitoring, ongoing supervision, ongoing mentoring is essential for ensuring that quality. With clear performance expectations, performance evaluations, and when needed corrective action plans will help to create and sustain that sense of accountability it is essential for all of our caregivers to give their very best quality of care to our little ones. We know that quality of staff is directly related to the quality of care that our children and our infants receive. So lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, ongoing review and an evaluation of the health and safety systems that are in the facility. We talked about the importance of training, refresher training, but to include in that within our safety systems is to have intentional trainings that will help caregivers understand what to do to respond in the situation of an emergency, to stay calm, what are they going to check for, what, um, you know, the, the child's breathing, all of these things. What are they going to do? They're going to call 911. They're going to do CPR. What then is training about the reporting protocol in the situation that, in a, that an incident occurs? 
who is going to be contacting the parent? How are they going to go about doing that? Contacting the licensing agency, law enforcement, health department. All of this is important as a structural piece to ensure that it, there is quality in the program. And our main goal always will be for all of our programs is by maintaining these health and safety systems. We're providing the safest places of nurture and care to all of our children and infants. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. <clears throat> that was a great way to um, kind of showcase how we use a series of programs and environmental strategies to create a safe environment. We're gonna move on to Dr. Suzanne Rodriguez, who is going to speak with us, as I said earlier, regarding discipline intervention in school settings. Suzanne has, is an expert in school administration and social work for nearly, with nearly 30 years of professional experience. She applies her expertise to forensic casework involving instances of injury, abuse, and negligence that occur within education and social services settings. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Suzanne can take over. And uh, just as Suzanne is doing that, just some of the cases that Suzanne and, and the rest of us work on are, are in this type of setting are abuse or set in regarding sexual, physical, emotional abuses, harassment, bullying, off-campus activities, and or violent altercations are just an example. In addition to off-site uh, type of things. So that's just some examples that, we're do that we work on. Hey, thank you. Oops. Suzanne. I'm coming. There we are. Hey, <laughs> Suzanne, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Great. I, you know, I'm going to take a moment to just remind everybody, because I, I forgot to say it earlier. If you want to find the full bios or the CVs for any of these experts, they're all online right at robsonforensic.com. If you navigate to the experts page, you can find everybody. Download their full CV. Um, it's, all, it's all right out there for you to, to check out. But Suzanne, th thank you, and, and, and thanks for allowing me to interrupt there for a moment. Uh, no problem. I'm actually having a little bit of technical difficulty here. I think I might, um, for some reason, it's not allowing me to continue my slide. Let's see if we can go on here. If this is the way. It's going to have to go that way. So um, glad to be with all of you here. Oh. Thanks for joining us today. I think I can, I think I'm going to be able to wing it here. And Suzanne, um, we're not seeing your screen right now. You're we, not. Okay. Yeah, so, so if you want to make sure you why. could be. about now it's working on it. it's always a little different on the day of the actual meeting right. there, there we are looks okay. great that's perfect great 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 so uh, yes thank you Lisa for that introduction and it's a pleasure today to be able to present with uh, my colleagues both Lisa and Janice um, as Lisa mentioned I have a very broad background I have my doctorate in education I have my master's in social work I'm also credentialed as a school uh, social worker um, as well as a certified a playground safety inspector. And so I've worked in public education um, for almost 30 years. I, I've run um, educational programs. Uh, at principal. I've been a principal. I've been a learning director. I work in administration um, of all aspects of, of, a, of a school program, as well as as a school social worker. I've conducted individual group and family counseling, um, crisis intervention, in case management, very involved with um, individualized education plans, 504 plans. Uh, I've also had uh, the opportunity to work in group homes, uh, probation, and, and child protective systems. So I'm very familiar with those systems and, and the students um, and adults that come through those systems. I also currently am a lecturer at Fresno State and I lecture in the social work uh, graduate department, uh, teaching advanced school social work in schools. And Lisa mentioned a little bit about our uh, forensic specialties, and, and today I'm going to focus specifically a lot on the um, physical injury pieces. And so um, the flow of the presentation will I'll cover a little bit of national school data, and then I'll talk a little bit about some um, case examination components, and then I'll close with some discipline response, prevention, and intervention efforts. So some, um, some recent data, 17, 18 data, indicate that we have had almost a million incidents that, are, that have occurred on school campuses, uh, almost half a million of nonviolent incidences uh, on uh, campuses nationally. And those violent incidences often are 
examples of, of physical attacks or fights, uh, sexual assaults, uh, rapes, or robberies. And so as we have um, these types of behaviors that occur on campus, we, we in turn have uh, risks that are identified. And, and these risks can result in uh, injury not only uh, to others, but also injury to self. And so as in reflecting back on what Lisa talked about in terms of foundation, um, that's the one of the first things as we approach a case is looking at you know, that foundation piece. What, what type of school are we dealing with? Is it a, a public school, a private school, a charter school? They're all gonna be run differently. They're all gonna have different protocols. And so that's, that's a critical piece for us to, to, to ascertain and understand. And in addition to that, you know, what, what grade level did this incident occur? Was it an elementary a setting? Uh, was it a high school setting? And those are critical pieces for us to understand and know because as you know, growing up, you know, you're a lot different now and in your age group, you were a lot different as a teenager versus a, an elementary school uh, student and same thing with your own children. And so uh, we're all at uh, diff different development, they're all at different developmental levels. And then also those school settings look a lot different. If you notice the, the pictures on your right, the bottom is a, is a you know, elementary school setting where they're primarily going to be self-contained with one teacher, uh, you know, organized uh, out, outdoor activity, whereas your high school above is going to be much more autonomous and also a lot more interaction. You have classes and periods that are, are changing throughout the day and you have large campuses um, as well. So those are really uh, critical pieces for us to understand and know to be able to assist um, in these particular cases. And we also want to know uh, the type of discipline that, that has occurred and what, what is that offense that occurred. Oftentimes, if we're, if we're identifying or dealing with an injury, there's been some sort of assault, some sort of fight that has occurred, uh, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or multiple students against one student. Uh, there also may be an, an incident of, of harassment, intimidation, or bullying. And so as we identify these, these types of discipline issues that have occurred, we also want to consider, you know, when and, and where, when and where did these incidences occur? Uh, it's critical to know, did it happen before school, during school, was it after school, was it on a school-sponsored activity off campus, was it at a park, uh, was it, was it, did it occur uh, to and from school, uh, was it at a, you know, football game versus inside a classroom? So all those things are important for us to understand and, and know. Uh, and in terms of uh, discovery and record review, we obviously want to uh, try to uh, obtain that, that cumulative folder, folder for those individuals that are involved. Uh, most school systems now have um, computerized data programs that track uh, discipline referrals, that track attendance, that track any uh, counselor or, or any administrator contact with students. And so that, that behavior history and that correspondence is also uh, critical for us to, to understand and know. Suzanne, but before you move on to the next slide, uh, we, we did have a quick question that came in just asking about trends in terms of some of these considerations. So before school, during school, after school, are you seeing anything change with the, um, uh, the, the prevalence of social media that, that this is different now than it was earlier in your career? Yeah, I definitely with, if we, if we want to consider, for example, cyberbullying, and there's a lot of, uh, I remember being in the trenches when we, you know, technology was advancing and we had access to these, students had access to these social platforms, and yes, there definitely became uh, much, we started to see some more cyberbullying issues, and as a result, uh, most school districts have some form of cyberbullying policies and procedures as a result. So yes, it, it does tend to, to change, and, and it's important that that school districts keep up with those, those trends and, and follow the, the state uh, regulations and mandates specific to those. Got it, great, thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. Um, and then in addition, um, as both uh, Lisa and um, Janice mentioned, we're gonna look at supervision. You know, when the incident occurred, uh, you know, where it was and, and who was on staff at the time of the incident. And so were there uh, certificated teachers or administrators or counselors present? Um, was it some classified folks? Um, were, were they just you know, uh, walk-on volunteers or parent volunteers at the time of the incident? And you know, what are those policies in terms of supervision? What did those ratios look like? You know, were we out at a you know, huge PE class? Were there two PE classes out there? Uh, was it in a self-contained classroom? Um, what, was that, what did that supervision look like? Was it active or passive? I know when I was a school principal, one of my peeves was, you know, having my supervisors all in a corner versus out mingling 
being observant with the students, interacting with them, being vigilant uh, and observing um, behavior uh, during their supervision. And then in addition to that, training and any planning uh, schedule and planning of supervision is critical for us to examine. And then in addition to that, uh, discipline policies and procedures, um, what, what, are, what are school rules and expectations? How are those communicated not only to students, but to staff and to parents? Um, are those, those expectations, how are they delivered? Um, um, are they included in student handbooks or parent handbooks? What do those uh, discipline guides look like? Every school administrator is going to have a discipline guide that will, some form of a discipline guide or behavior matrix that is going to um, allow or provide a structure for the type of consequence that is going to recur, occur as a result of a particular uh, discipline offense. And then it's also going to show uh, progressive discipline. If it's my first fight, um, what does that consequence look like? If it's my second fight, it's my third fight, or what have you, you're going to see some form of progressive discipline and want to know what that progressive discipline policy looks like. And then in addition to that, ensuring that you're uh, looking at the board policy uh, and administrative regulations. In, in terms of staffing and training, um, primarily superintendents, principals, and or designees, such as an assistant principal or learning director, are authorized to to, uh, to, to issue discipline. And so most states, uh, they vary by state. The state of California, for example, requires an administrative credential. Uh, however, some might call it, a, some states might call it an administrative certificate or something to that effect. It varies by state, but nonetheless, there is some form of, of holder of that, that authority to issue discipline. And then there's also professional standards for educational leaders that we might consider. Um, these are national standards. Every state has some, has adopted some form of these standards. Uh, in California, they're just called the California Professional Standards for Educational Leaders. And these standards guide administrator preparation and training. Another area that we're going to want to uh, examine if warranted. And then in addition, we're wanting to look at school response. How did the school respond to um, that discipline, that incident? Um, it could vary. You might see some, you know, whether it be in that behavior history or particular to the incident, were there issues or were there responses specific to in-school suspension where maybe a student, uh, where a student is, is housed uh, away from that classroom or classes for the day and in a small classroom or a classroom with one supervisor. Was it an out-of-school suspension where students are sent out for a short period of days and then allowed to return to school? Or were there a recommendation for expulsion where you're looking at a school site uh, recommending expulsion um, out of the uh, school district in its entirety? And then lastly, just other means of correction. Um, over the last eight to 10 years, we've seen more of a push to actually align consequences with the purpose of discipline, which is to uh, help students learn from their mistakes uh, and, improve their, and improve their behavior. And specific to the state of California, California uh, Ed Code 48900.5 um, really talks and, and identifies other means of correction. And, and this is specific to nonviolent offenses. However, every state will have some of, of this in, in, in their policies or procedures. And it really is a focus on uh, you know that, that, that an issue has occurred. How are we uh, schools preventing and intervening? And what do those efforts look like? Um, examples could be, uh, student parent teacher conferences, uh, a small study team, study, student study team, uh, anger management groups. Um, it also could include restorative uh, justice programs or tiered interventions. And you often might hear PBIS or positive behavior intervention supports or RTI, response to intervention. These are all um, areas that, that support other means of correction. And so an example of restorative justice, uh, excuse me, restorative practices is very similar to uh, restorative justice in that you have um, a victim and offender coming together, willingly coming together, um, identifying injustices that have occurred, um, coming to some solution, uh, and then ultimately, and, then, and some solutions and ways that they can prevent the incidents from occurring again, and then ultimately ending in some form if, if, if provided the opportunity and, and that there's some form of amends or expression of remorse. And this is a huge shift. Not all schools 
practice restorative practices, but again, this is just an example of other means of correction that are um, available to students and, and used in some school districts. And then lastly, just some important considerations as we're reviewing a case, we're gonna want to know also, is anybody involved identified um, as receiving special education services? And, and this could be a whole other presentation on its own, um, but I'm gonna, when, we're, when we're reviewing this, this is important for us to know so that we can identify, you know, are, are there individualized education plans in place? Um, were there manifestation determination reviews conducted if warranted? And that's just a, evaluating if that behavior um, the identified behaviors related to their disability, and then were there any change of placements and IEPs held as a result? Again, just some uh, an important piece um, that that would need to be explored if 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 any individuals were identified as as um, receiving special ed services. And so, lastly, this is just an overview of my presentation. As um, every case is different, and and we'll approach every case as it comes to us. But these are just some areas that that we'll uh, be reviewing. Uh, and to give our best insight and, and uh, support to any cases that come our way um, and information to make um, your jobs um, um, informative as well. Thank you. Wonderful, thank, thank you, Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, but before we move on to the more general question and answer, during your session, we had Brian ask a question um, of whether or not you've seen liability extending to schools for cyberbullying cases, if, if that bullying occurred outside of the school. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if, if maybe your background's better equipped to answer, you know, what are the schools doing to, to prevent this, right? Because the, the liability, well, maybe you can. What, what's, um, what has been your experience on that? And, and Lisa, if it makes sense for you to jump in on this one, uh, please feel free to as well. It really does depend on the, the legislation and what's the policies that are written. I know that um, if the, the, the cyber bullying occurs, or if there's a particular um, incident that occurred related to cyber bullying off campus and, and it's known, I can't remember the exact wording, but if there's something that, if we know that the, it has the potential to affect um, something, uh, the campus or, or the disruption of the campus or the school, it, 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 I think that's when there's an opportunity to, to intervene. And so it really does depend on uh, the policy uh, and the, the actual incident that, that occurred, mm -hmm. context of that incident. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. It really depends upon the specifics of the individualized case and how that is affecting the student body. Got it, that makes sense. Um, so we do have a few minutes left over for questions. We, ha we had a, a number of questions that came in over the course of the program. If you think of a question um, after, we, after we end today, please send that into inquiries at robsonforensic.com. We can put you in touch with the appropriate expert and we'll be sure to get an answer out to you. Um, Lisa, one of the other questions that came in through the, through the email box uh, was relevant to some of these foundational principles that you discussed and and you had mentioned screening and running a background check on candidates during that that hiring process and and the question was whether or not that's enough so if if somebody clears that background check is have they satisfied their responsibility for for ensuring that that's a safe person that's a really good question so when we look at any of those screening or vetting processes, we're not just looking at one alone. We're looking at a combination of strategies used in order to uh, screen a candidate so that they can be the best candidate for, for the, pro, for the um, particular program. But yes, background clearance is enough or are not enough because we know that many predators can get through the doors because they don't have a background. They don't have a criminal background. However, they're still perpetrators. So we want to use a combination of strategies to screen potential candidates for employment. Got it. That makes sense. You know what? The um, that question in your answer reminded me of the oddly enough of the trucking webinar that we did a few weeks ago. Right? That you, you have a new driver who doesn't have anything on their record, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a, a good choice to put behind the wheel of a tractor trailer. Certainly, same concept with with keeping an eye on our children. Um, Right, and of course, the most direct care, the most direct contact are those that you want to ha have the highest screening for. So if we have a 
um, a groundskeeper who's never near any children at all or never near our targeted population, that's a different level than we have somebody who's in direct care on an everyday, perhaps overnight, and they're the only person who's on shift that night. So we want to clearly make sure that the screening process is appropriate to the job description. That makes sense. Now, Lisa, we just had a question come in from Tony asking about the effectiveness of waivers to offset potential liability. Now that to me sounds like a question for more for an attorney to answer, but, but do you have experience um, looking at waivers in your casework? Is that something that you're frequently involved in? Uh, can we clarify that? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Well, and, and maybe I don't have enough information to, uh, to get into it. I, I, I read his question as waivers that maybe the, the parents would have signed. Um, for having their children in care and, and whether or not that would offset liability. But may, maybe that's not a good question for us to field here. Um, Janice, we, we did have, um, we had another question that came in involving uh, your slide on, on SIDS, right? And, and so you had mentioned that, that SIDS is most common in the first few months of a baby's life. Um, but so this question was asking, do we see the same uh, causes or contributing factors in, in older infants as well? So, good question. Thank you. SIDS is, an, is a, um, a condition that's been determined that can happen between the first year of life. So that means that a SIDS case could be determined as the cause of a crib death um, from zero, from, from a newborn, up until they're 12 months of age. What we tend to see and what it's shown is that the occurrence is higher those first few months of life, um, the first three, four months of life um, than with the older age. But it, it definitely can occur up until 12 months of age. And in the case of SIDS, it's uh, determined to be a SIDS case after um, there's no explanation after the autopsy has been done, a, a thorough investigation has been done, which also includes examining the child's health history. If looking at all those components doesn't indicate a reason for um, the, the child's death, then it's determined to be a SIDS case. Got it. Uh, thank you for clarifying. That's, um, that's helpful. I know uh, it's always a relief when your children reach a certain age where you yeah, can kind that of first that birthday. Line. Yeah, <laughs> my goodness. Um, that's really all the time that we have for today. I, I really want to thank you all for the time that you took to not only to be here, but the time to prepare for being here today. For any of the attendees, if you have questions that we didn't have a chance to field, please email us at inquiries at robsonforensic.com. If you'd like to arrange a time to meet one-on-one -on -one with any of the speakers we had featured here today, we can also do that. I mean, ultimately, um, we do this because we want to connect with our clients and our potential clients. So if you have a question, if you have a case that you'd like to talk about, reach out. Um, we'll run a conflict check. We can often do a a preliminary conversation about a case at no cost. Um, find out whether or not we're in a position to help you. So, so thank you all for, for being here today. We hope to see you again in future webinars, and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Everybody have a great day. Okay, thank you. Bye now. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Thank you, Jesse. Thank, thank you, you, Jesse. <laughs>